Um, okay, so this work is based on some recent work with Nicholas Garthier Trellis and Ryan Murray. You can kind of find all the details in this paper, which uh, went into the archive a couple of months ago. So this is work is, is building on um, earlier work by mainly by Nicholas, um, looking at the rates of convergence of Chiga cuts. So um, the first part of this talk is going to be mainly on sort of Nicholas's prior work, and then hopefully I can get to the end where actually me and Ryan have made a contribution in sort of uh, extending these sort of uh, these convergence results and sort of getting rates of convergence. Okay, so let's kind of start really sort of basic and um, what is learning? So in learning, we're given a set of feature vectors. So Xi, they live in some space X. So this could be a Euclidean space, for example, it could be on a manifold. Um, and then we're given a set of labels. So the labels could be real valued, they could be categorical valued, um, whatever the data set is. So a learning problem is to find a function u, which either goes from the whole space x onto your space of labels, or it goes from your, from your data sets onto the set of labels, depending on how you set the problem up. A supervised learning problem is where you have observations for every single feature vector. So, okay, so here, you know, each, each xi, there exists a yi. Um, a clustering problem is the opposite. So this is where you have no labels at all. And then the semi-supervised learning sort of lives in between where you have that label for a subset. So the results on this talk are mainly in the clustering, uh, the clustering regime, um, because it depends, you know, it's, the, the framework is sort of, um, would allow for supervised or semi-supervised as well. The idea behind clustering is you're trying to learn from the geometry of the data. Okay, so how do you represent the geometry of the data? We'll go into this through a graph. These graphs are slightly uh, slightly different setting to uh, Sophia's talk. You also use graphs, but okay, we're going to use the random geometric graph model rather than the sort of Erdos uh, Renault uh, graphs. Okay, so for a graph, it's going to consist of uh, nodes and edges. So the nodes are formed from the feature vectors, and then the edges come with a weight we call Wij, and this somehow measures the similarity between the feature vectors. Okay, so you understand this as uh, Wij is sort of close to zero, means that Xi and Xj are dissimilar. Wij being very large means Xi and Xj are very similar. Okay, and then we define a, a graph by um, putting an edge between the nodes and then weighting according to this, um, according to this um, weight. Okay, and we, we kind of inherit a geometry from this graph. So for example, we can see this seven here is sort of very close to this one here. There's only one uh, edge between the two. On the other hand, this seven is very dissimilar from this one here because to get from this one to this seven, you have to go via sort of several other, um, other nodes. <clears throat> so the idea then behind clustering is, okay, how do we kind of um, exploit this sort of, um, this geometry to sort of, uh, well, the, the cluster. Okay, so there's sort of several sort of natural questions, which are really just one, one question, um, if we're being honest. What happens if we get more data? So the idea is we want to sort of replace these sort of, um, these sort of float clouds instead with probability measures, uh, which the, we assume that the data is sampled from. So there's sort of a couple of problems there, so how do we scale these problems? And then we can ask, okay, what's the properties of the continuum problem past the discrete problem? And we've seen this already several times in this workshop where People, you know, in the context of neural networks, have suggested you know we should be studying this sort of um, optimal optimal uh, flows type formulations because then we can uh, sort of um, these are kind of easier to understand um, analytically, and then we can sort of pass these down to the, uh, the properties down to, onto the discrete levels to sort of understand what's going on in our sort of finite uh, population samples. Okay, and then maybe another motivation is to um, try and connect what. Uh, people are doing it in applied analysis to the analysis of data. There's sort of many sort of very smart and very clever sort of results in applied analysis. And the idea is, can we just make our problem look like um, look like their problems, and then we can start to apply their results and their methods? Okay, so the the, the, probably the most important sort of uh, function on this talk is going to be the sort of uh, graph total variation. I'm going to start off by sort of um, you know, telling you what it is. So the graph total variation is essentially an analog of the total variation, but now on a point cloud. So we take a function u, which is going to live on our, on our graph or on our point cloud xn. 
Okay, and then, so the normal total variation is essentially just an L1 norm of the derivative, because on a graph, we don't have derivatives, it's a discrete space. Instead, we can replace derivatives with finite differences. And what we end up with is um, looking at such a, uh, the difference to xi minus to xj weighted by the, the graph weight between the two um, um, along that edge. Okay, so this gives us you know, what we can kind of consider to be the analog of the uh, variation. Okay, so if I was just interested in minimizing the graphic variation or I didn't care about asymptotics, then of course it would be enough just to have this summation. I want to take n off to infinity where n is the number of data points, so I have to sort of normalize in, in some way. But the, now I just leave this normalization as this mysterious constant uh, Zn epsilon. Um, so n is the number of data points, epsilon is going to be the length scale on the graph, and I'll sort of uh, tell you more about this, this soon. Okay, so um, in this talk, we're interested in variational problems involving total variation. So in particular, we're interested in balanced cuts, of which the Chiga cut is a particular, particular special case. Um, there's lots of other methods which use total variation, which I'm not going to cover. So these include things like trend filtering, lasso, uh, Ginsburg Landau functionals. Um, a lot of the methods which I will talk about today also can be applied to these uh, problems as well. And actually, in particular, trend filtering we're kind of working on, on this, this currently. Okay, so why is the graph total variation an uh, interesting functional to, uh, to consider? Well, it's, it's partly to do with its relationship to the cut functional. So what is the cut functional? So if I take a set here, a n, okay, and I want to know what is the cut of this set, it is is basically up to some sort of um, multiplicative constant. The cost of the uh, cutting the edges um, between the two sets. Okay, so in particular, if we define the cut, the, the cut of a set an be the graph total variation of the indicator function of this set an. Okay, by definition, this uh, graph total variation is just given okay, as it's in the second line in here. Okay, and now we notice that this. Um, inside the absolute value, this is only going to be positive if xi is in a difference, in the different set to um, xj. Okay, so if xi is in, is in an and xj is in an complement, okay, then, then this is going to be positive. If xi and xj are both in an or both in an complement, this is really going to be zero. So this cut then is just, you know, as I said before, up to some constant, the cost of uh, cutting the edges between the set and the set's complement. This is quite nice because it sort of gives us an intuitive measure on like how good the cut is. So here, if I'm going to make this cut here, I only have to cut two edges. So I'd say, okay, this is quite good. On the other hand, if I was to make a cut straight down here, um, a vertical cut, then you would have to cut many edges and you'll say, okay, this is quite a bad cut. Um, okay, so now let me talk about the, the scaling in the graph. So at a high level, all you need to know is that um, epsilon is going to control the connectivity radius of the graph. Okay, so let me also say that this, uh, the graph total variation is a non-local problem. Right? So we're connecting um, you know, nodes with other nodes, and to clearly you know, finite differences rather than derivatives, this is non-local. Okay, and the length scale of this problem is going to be epsilon, because this is the point at which we're, we're connecting. In this talk, we're going to want to make a connection to total variation. Okay, so total variation, of course, is a local functional. It only depends on derivatives, there's no, no quite differences. What this kind of means is that we're going to have to scale epsilon to zero. Again, I want to kind of point out that sending epsilon to zero is a modeling choice. And of course, maybe you, you think for your problem that it's better to have epsilon uh, fixed. And people have indeed studied this problem. I can refer to, to a couple of papers from the group from our farm, and they've for similar type problems, they've looked at the problem where epsilon greater than zero is, is fixed and doesn't scale uh, with n. Okay, so how do we sort of represent this epsilon in our problem? Okay, well, it's, it's captured through the graph weights. So our graph weights are going to be a function of the distance between two nodes. Okay, and this function itself depends on epsilon. Okay, and it depends on epsilon as follows. So e to epsilon t is just equal to one of epsilon to the m, where m is the dimension of the data, um, multiplied by eta t over epsilon. So if we think of like a typical example where, say, eta is the indicator function on zero, one, what this will mean is that the weights are positive only when the two uh, 
when the two nodes are close to an epsilon and the node be zero otherwise. Um, Matthew has frozen. Um, okay, so now let's kind of just do like a- Matthew, Matthew, you, Matthew, the connection is breaking up a bit, at least as far as I can see. Um, uh, so just, if you could just repeat, go back one slide and perhaps repeat what was on the, at the end of the previous slide there. I think I, I got up into the last bullet point and then I think it started to get a little bit flaky. Okay, good. Am, am I back now? Am I, you can hear me now. Okay, good. Um, okay, so, okay, so I, I will repeat, I guess, this, this final point here, where, how we define the graph weights. So the important thing is, since is the graph weights depend on the difference uh, between, on the distance between the two, uh, two, two feature vectors, and it's scaled by epsilon, and it's scaled by epsilon in such a way that if we think of eta as just being the indicator function over zero one, then these weights are positive only when um, the distance between xi and xj is less than epsilon and that's zero otherwise. Um, okay, so let me sort of move on to like a toy, a toy sort of calculation, which gives us the, um, the, the limit of this graph type of variation. So let us assume that xi are iid from some positive measure mu, which has a continuous density rho. Um, okay, we'll take n off to infinity, and then we'll take this, take epsilon equal to some epsilon n, which is going to go to zero at the same time. And let's start with some u, which is sort of, you know, continuously differentiable. Okay, so by definition, the graph of variation is equal to the following. So this is exactly the same as definition. All I've done is I've substituted in what the normalization constant was. This one is n squared epsilon n times epsilon n. And then I've substituted in what the weights are, so the weights of one over epsilon to the m times eta epsilon minus xj over epsilon. Okay, so formally I can kind of replace this double summation uh, with an integral with respect to the data generating measure and leave everything else alone. Okay, then if I do a change of coordinates, let z be equal to x minus y over epsilon n. Okay, uh, you know, this is, we can all kind of see this is, I get this sort of straight away. Okay, now if I can assume my epsilon is very small, and let's say rho is continuous, then this rho of y plus epsilon n dead is approximately equal to rho of y. So now I get a rho squared um, y here. Okay, and then similarly we can kind of see that this difference here is approximately equal to a derivative in the direction of that. Again, very formally, this is kind of what we kind of expect in the limit. Make one extra step and kind of play a little trick and use the isotropy of eta to pull out the z integral as a constant. So what I get then is an integral over y multiplied by some constants. And this of course is exactly, you know, without this row here, this would be the total variation. It's the L1 norm of the derivative. Um, but now I have this sort of row, weighting row here. This is a weighted total variation space. This was for uh, u is in C1. Of course, I can define this for any u in, uh, in L1 using the usual sort of uh, dual formulation. So normally this, this row squared will be one. Um, but now okay, we have this, this, this weighting. So this is what we can expect the, the continuum limit to look like. Okay, let's sort of go back to the variational problems. And let me start by saying, of course, if we just want to minimize this uh, graph total variation term, well, this is very easy to do. Any sort of a uh, constant function is going to, um, u being equal to constant, minimizes it straight away. And again, if I want to minimize the cut functional, or well, the empty sets minimizes this, or the whole sets minimizes this. This is kind of not interesting from a variational point of view, but of course, you know, this is not what people do. People sort of modify it to get non-trivial minimizers. There's two sort of possible ways to do this. So one is to sort of add on you know, a data fidelity term or uh, we will probably call this the negative log likelihood. Um, okay, and consider sort of uh, minimization problems like this. Another way to do it is to look at the um, look at, uh, minimizing a balanced term here. So we have the factor variation divided by something, okay, which is going to um, force us to have non trivial minimizers. It's the second type of problem that we're going to consider in this, in this talk. Of course, you know, the, the first form itself is. Um, interesting in its own, own right. 
Uh, right. <clears throat> so I've kind of said we want to look at the large data limits of um, what's going to happen to these variational problems on, on our graph. Um, but the problem we have is that we've only defined our discrete problem on the point cloud. So it's not extended on the whole domain, but only on the point cloud. But in the limits, of course, we're, we're comparing something with the density. So this is going to be defined on the whole space. The question is, how can we compare this discrete, um, this discrete function to a continuum function? So this means we kind of need um, some sort of discrete continuum convergence. And to do this is to not think of a, a function on its own, but think, think of it as a function coupled with a measure. Okay, so in our case here, you know, we have our discrete function un, which lives on a discrete set. And then we're going to have an empirical measure mu n, okay, which lives on you know, the whole space. So mu un is a probability measure, okay, and un is only defined with respect to mu n. Okay, and then we have our continuum function u and our continuum measure mu. Okay, and this now means that we can think of our functions as being in the same space. We think of functions and measures, so then this lives in like a, you know, a much bigger space. We call the TLP space. So this is a set of functions and measures, and our discrete and continuum minimizes are both elements of this uh, TLP space. Of course, this TLP space needs topology, and one way to put a, a metric on it is to use this sort of optimal transport sort of idea, where we sort of um, look at minimizing this um, you know, some sort of penalty between. Uh, okay, so what do I do here? So I First of all, I, I take a map T, which sort of um, can be seen as being rearranging mu into nu, where I want to compare sort of, you know, mu and v nu. And then I compare how u and v compose to T in the LP distance. And of course, I don't want my T to be too degenerate, so I, can, I also add a penalization on the map T. This is essentially just the optimal transport distance. So actually, this is exactly the optimal transport distance on the graphs of the functions. So a lot of the theory as to you know, why this is a metric and the existence of these T's, et cetera, follows directly from the optimal transport theory. This distance never really appears in the, in the sort of results I'm going to show you. It can kind of be hidden away by a sort of simplification by the following proposition. So we, so Nicholas Gathia, Tristan, and Sepchev, they used to characterize this convergence and they showed the following, that this, um, we have a sequence UN, UN converging to mu mu in the TLP topology. Well, this is true if and only if mu n is converging weak star to mu, and there exists a sequence of transport maps, okay, pushing towards mu n to mu n, such that tn is converging to density in LP, and most importantly, that mu n composed of tn is converging to mu in the LP distance. Essentially, what this means is that we can kind of forget about this sort of you know, complicated metric, and we can just look at finding uh, a transport map tn Okay, with the property that u over the tn is converging to u in the lp distance. Of course, in our case, this, this mu n is the empirical measure, and this is converging to mu uh, with probability one. You know, so we can kind of forget about this. Okay, so with this sort of topology in hand, and the result by Nicholas and Diane was to establish that the graph total variation is converging to the total variation in the sense of gamma convergence. So I don't really have time to explain what gamma convergence is, but essentially it's a way of linking variational problems. Um, okay, and there's sort of some extensions. Let me, you know, as this, this workshop is, you know, at Bath, there's a paper by Muller and Penrose that kind of um, improved the, the scaling in the regime where m is equal to two by reducing the logarithmic factor on the scaling of epsilon. Um, and the ideas behind sort of this sort of discrete uh, continuum actually really came from uh, sort of this group by Alberti and Bellatini, who looked at sort of non-local continuum operators. Um, and then the idea is just to go from discrete to uh, continuum non-local. Let me keep going, because I guess uh, I want to be sort of finishing the next sort of 15 minutes or so. Okay, <clears throat> so let's go back to uh, sort of graph cuts. So we've already seen the definition um, of the cut, it's just the graph total variation of the indicator function. Um, you know, I have said before that this is trivial to minimize. So we, we, we consider a balanced cut, and really anything which has this sort of property would work. So we just kind of need the empty set to have uh, the balanced term to be zero and the full set to be zero, and this would then force us to have uh, non trivial minimizers. So, of course, there's, there's lots of different ways to do this. And again, it's a modeling choice of how you want to choose your BM. In the GIGA framework, you would choose the balance term to be equal to the minimum of the 
essentially the empirical mass of A um, and the empirical mass of a complement. Okay, so mu n here is the empirical measure. So mu n of A, you just count the number of uh, data points in the set A and then you normalize to by n. It's just a fraction of points, right, that are, that are in the set A or the fraction of points that are in the set A complement. Okay, the Giga constant then is the minimizer of this sort of um, graphical variation uh, applied to the indicator functions over A and this balance term. And then the Giga cut is the minimizer of this, uh, of this sort of uh, energy. Okay, so what we care about now is how is the Giga constant and the Giga cut, how are they behaving? So what happens as n goes off to infinity? Are they converging to something? Is there you know, a continuum Giga problem? Okay, so the um, well, okay, so let, let me sort of make a connection with spectral clustering. It's kind of a, so okay, so if u is an indicator function over a, then actually I can write this sort of Dirichlet energy here. So this is like an L two type problem. So the energy is just going to be uh, proportional to the graph total variation. Um, okay, and similar sort of the denominator, this sort of L two um, distance between u and its average is actually going to be kind of proportional to um, in this balance term here. Okay, so this is true when you use an indicator function. It's not true in for sort of any function. Essentially, you know, we, I mean, this is true because if we square zero or one, we end up with zero or one. So the L2, L1 kind of makes no difference. Um, <clears throat> but this term here now is probably quite familiar to some people. Um, because if we are minimizing this over any function, so not just indicator functions, any function, then this is the um, this is actually the, the first non-trivial eigenvector of the graph Laplacian. So if we were to solve this problem to define the u which minimizes this, we'd end up with the first um, non-trivial eigenvalue, and then this, of course, then kind of is in the realm of, sort of spectral clustering. So in some sense, Giga Giga cut is a sort of constrained spectral clustering um, method. <clears throat> Right, so let me show you this, this theorem now, again, by Nicholas, Diane, and some of our other collaborators. So first of all, let me define this C. So this is going to be the, uh, cont the continuum Chiga constant. So this is the minimizer over all sets in A of the total variation um, divided by the balance term. And now, of course, the balance term depends on the, um, on the data generating measure mu and not on the, uh, the empirical measure. Again, A star is going to be our continuum Chiga cut and this is the minimizer of the energy. So what Nicholas and Diane showed is that the Giga constant is going to converge to the continuum Giga constant, and that these sets here are going to converge to the um, continuum Giga cut. And there's the result really kind of follows by the sort of stability properties of gamma convergence, but they have no rates. Okay, so the rest of this talk now is going to be on how to get the rates of convergence for this Giga cut to the continuum Giga cut and the discrete uh, yeah, and the sweet uh, Chiga constants to the continuum Chiga constants. Okay, so let me make the following assumptions. M is going to be a d-dimensional manifold, and mu is going to be the probability measure with uniform density on the manifold. Our first sort of comparison is going to be between the graph total variation and its expectation. So now we can, so the graph total variation is a double summation. So this is a U statistic of order two. So what's a U statistic? Well, a u-statistic of order one is just a sum of a, a single sum of some random variables, so it'd be some sum of f of xi. A u-statistic of order two is a double summation of uh, some function of xi and xj. Or a u-statistic of order three is a triple summation of, okay, you, you see what I'm getting with that. I mean, it's kind of very well known that u-statistics of order one have like Bernstein inequalities, and this is sort of true for higher order u-statistics as well. So in particular, we can we can sort of make a bound between the graph total variation and this expected value, which is just this non-local total variation. Okay, and we can say this is less than some zeta with high probability. So I'm kind of hiding the high probability bound here. This, of course, depends on zeta. So if zeta is um, zeta is too small, right? Then actually, this isn't with, with high probability. So it's, it's kind of like a there's, a there's a kind of a trade-off here. <clears throat> Okay, then there's kind of like a, just a direct computation that for any sort of U of bound variation, we can bound the non-local total variation by the, okay, by the local total variation up to some uh, error term of epsilon squared. 
Okay, and then a half difference inequality will be used for the um, for the balance term. And this essentially says that the empirical measure is close to the, the continuum measure. Again, this is less than for t with high probability. Again, this with high probability depends on on t. So how do we get an upper bound? Well, this is quite straightforward. So we have the so we have the discrete g get cut here. This now can be bounded by any. But I just need a candidate to to plug into the, the kind of the Chiga energy. So as my candidate, I'll just use the, the continuum optimizer. So I'll use the indicator of, of A star, where A star solves the continuum problem. And this, of course, is going to be greater than the Chiga cut. OK, now I can start using my bounds. So I have uh, the graph total variation is bounded by the non local total variation up to an error. I can do these empirical measures and put the true measures up to some error of T. Then I replace the non local total variation by the, by the continuum total by this local total variation, and again, I get an extra error of epsilon squared. And I notice that this term here, so I just wait for the multiply to go past, um, is this term here is just the, the g the constant for the continuum problem. Okay, so I get uh, kind of an easy upper bound. Okay, what about the lower bound? So this now is going to be harder, right? Because if I want to kind of repeat this calculation here, but I'd start off with my continuum g to cut here, and then I want a candidate minimizer for the continuum cut. So I kind of, kind of want to build my, my uh, candidate for the continuum gig cut from the discrete g, from the discrete gig cut. The problem is my discrete gig cut is only defined on the point cloud. It's not defined everywhere. So what I'm going to need to do is to, ex, is to somehow map my uh, discrete gig cut onto, like a, onto the whole manifold. So I do this in two steps. So the first step is I take this transport map uh, Tn. So this is a transport map between mu n and almost the measure that I want. Uh, so I'll come back to this sort of mu n tilde shortly. But this mu n tilde is going to be a measure which is defined on the whole, in the whole manifold. Um, okay, so what this, this transport map Tn, you can kind of understand this is just a partitioning of the, of the manifold. So what this means is sort of, you know, every partition is associated with one point on the, uh, on, on the point clouds. So when I do, so for any function u, I compose this to my tn, and this u composed with tn is now defined on the whole manifold. The problem is, is that this u composed with tn is now a piecewise constant um, uh, interpolation, and I'm going to need more smoothness. So what we do is we introduce this modifier lambda a, okay, which is going to smooth things out on the length scale of a. Essentially, this means that you know, after I just I take my sort of discrete function, I put it into a continuous function, I smooth it, it means I have a nice sort of continuous function on, the, on my manifold. This allows me to kind of control the vector value. So I won't talk too much about this mu until there, but actually this mu until there is just kind of a, an artificial uh, measure which we kind of use to get better rates, essentially. Um, one can ignore this and just set, you know, so, so theta is my error between my mu and tilde and my mu. If one just wants to set theta b equal to zero, you can do this. You just get like a worse rate if in two dimensions. Um, okay, so this sort of map IA, which is my composition with Tn with my modification, this essentially is behaving like a modifier would. So, you know, we get the usual sort of bound that I look at the CK norm, while well, this is you know, the L infinity norm over A to the minus, or over A to the K. And again, I can sort of control my L1 this, this, uh, difference between my you know, U composite Tn and my sort of U composite Tn after modification by the variation uh, by some sort of A. <clears throat> okay, now I can sort of make, a, again, a direct computation and say with high probability, we can bound the continuum total variation by of this U after this sort of modification by the graph total variation plus some sort of error, okay, which depends on how much we're modifying, by on how close our, our map Tn is to the identity, by our length scale epsilon, by this theta, which depends on how, how much I had to approximate this discrete measure, by with the, the continuum measure, okay, and then, yeah, and so on. <clears throat> My next sort of uh, tool is going to be to relax the, 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 the continuum Chiga problem to being over functions rather than over sets. So if u is an indicator function, then this, uh, okay, then we know that the TV of the indicator function is, is, is what uh, is the cut functional. Okay, and it turns out the balance problem can kind of be uh, written in such a way that, uh, 
that this minimization problem is equivalent to the, the problem that I had over sets if we choose uh, the balance term to be u minus the median of uh, u. So this m1 u is the median of u, and then I can look at this in the l1 norm. It means now instead of considering this uh, Problem here, which is a problem over sets, I can consider this as a problem over functions. <clears throat> okay, so this is now I've got enough tools now to build my, my candidates uh, minimizer. Okay, so I take my, my a n star, which is my discrete Tudor cut. I use this to define an a, which is going to be on the on the manifold. I will use the following result that the L1 norm between okay, this sort of interpolation modification map and the median is close to being the um, to the balance term okay, in terms of its, its, its okay, that this distance is bounded by some, some um, constant times a times the graph total variation. This essentially follows that as, um, this, this map here is close to being zero or one. So when I look at the median, this is the median is going to be close to being sort of zero or one. And, well, it is what it is. It's... Okay, so now anyway, at least I have a candidate uh, minimizer. So, okay, so then I can bound my Chiga cut by this uh, by this candidate, okay, which is this sort of you know, interpolation map um, of, the, of this function. Okay, and then I can use my sort of bounds. So I can bound this continuum map by the graph total variation up to some error. Okay, the, the denominator gets bounded by some error. And if I just go through this, um, I get again the, the Chiga cut plus uh, the continuum plus, plus this, this error. Okay, and this is kind of summarized in this following theorem. So now, okay, I make the sort of hyperbolic bounds explicit. I get the sort of the upper bound and the, and the lower bound um, between the sort of streets to the continuum. Now, the more interesting uh, problem is can we get a rate of convergence for the Chiga cuts? Okay, and the answer to this is going to be yes as well. So now let me just make a connection with isoparametric inequalities. So the isoparametric problem is given some volume V, define the sets with the volume, with that volume of the smallest perimeter. Okay, so this is um, sort of, you know, it's kind of easy to write this function down um, in Euclidean spaces because IV is just going to be the surface area of the ball of volume V. In manifolds, of course, this is, this is not, not true. Um, it turns out that you can write the Chiga problem as just being the infimum of all volumes between zero and one of the isoparametric function divided by the balance term, which is now just V1 minus V. Okay, so this IV, right, is the smallest possible perimeter okay, of, uh, of sets with a given volume V. Okay, and you, know, you can kind of derive these sort of bounds, bounds here, which is um, which kind of you know give you a, um, I guess, you know, a, a lower bound on the perimeter of, of uh, any set of a given volume. Okay, so what we're going to ask for is a quantitative version of this. So a quantitative version would be if you give me a set of a given volume, and you tell me that this uh, the perimeter of this set is close to the optimal value, so say within delta, then the question would be is how close is a, a to a minimizer of, um, well, of, of the uh, isoparametric equality? So can we characterize, so in a Euclidean space, just be asking how close is a to a ball? In a, a manifold, this will just be how close is a to um, a minimizer of this problem here. So this problem was solved by Fusco, Magini, and Batali. Okay, and so they did this in Euclidean spaces. In Euclidean spaces, we, the minimizers are, are um, balls B. So their result essentially was to say that um, if you're given a set, a set um, A with given volume V, and this um, and the perimeter of this set A is close to. Well, okay. So actually, they just sorry, let me restate this again. So they have they have a bound essentially between the set how close the set A is to a minimizer of the isoparametric inequality. And this distance is measured in terms of the functional asymmetry. So this is some function that I call here alpha A. This measures the volume of um, the set A 
to a uh, minimize of the isoparametric inequality um, and it takes the, you know, the best possible the best possible ball. Essentially, you look at balls and so for the, sort of over, for the overlapping A in the optimal sort of uh, sense. And then this can be bounded by the difference in parameters between A and the parameter of a, of a ball. So what you know is that if the parameter of A is close to being the parameter of B, then alpha A squared has to be small. So this gives you then a kind of an L1 sort of type bound on the difference between A to uh, a minimize of isoparametric inequality. This was extended um, by Trubush, Engelstein, and Spola uh, in, uh, just last year, actually, to um, general manifolds. So they had to have slightly more assumptions. So they, they assumed that the, the boundaries, the perimeter, is, is smooth. And they need that A star is either a strict or integral uh, minimizer. So I can explain what this is uh, on the next slide. But OK, if we're given these assumptions on the minimizer, then they can essentially get the same results. So, so again, they get the, the perimeter the difference in perimeters. Um, okay, sorry, so this is a typo. This B here should be uh, the A star. We can say that the perimeter, the perimeter of A is close to being the, the perimeter of the optimal uh, choice. Then, this, then the difference between difference of A to uh, a solution of the isoparametric inequality also has to be small in terms of this. So this is the result we'll kind of use to get convergence of the Chica cuts. So let me quickly explain what uh, strict integral minimizers are. The strict minimizer means that any perturbation of the minimizer is no longer a minimizer. In particular, it kind of means that the, um, we're kind of uh, coercive around the minimizers. The, the minimum of the isochromatic inequality is essentially, you know, behaves sort of quadratically around uh, minimizers. Um, I'm trying to go a little bit quicker so I can finish in the next couple of minutes. Another sort of class, uh, which is kind of interesting, is, is where we kind of allow for um, a set of minimizers to be parameterized. So the example here would be on a sort of torus. So you can see here now this is a, a minimizer. But of course, if I move this around, sort of around the torus, then of course I'm still going to be a minimizer. And this is still fine. So what this, so what this sort of this condition here is essentially saying is that there exists some sort of a diffeomorphism along the set of uh, minimizers. And as long as this diffeomorphism is kind of you know, well enough behaved, then, then this is also, also fine. So with these sort of conditions, so okay, so we we assume here that essentially the, the conditions to apply the previous theorem hold. We also have to kind of assume some sort of uh, strong convexity around minimizers in terms of the volume. Um, then we can get a high probability bound between the the minimizer of the sweet Giga energy and the minimizer of the continuum Giga uh, problem. This is kind of given in terms of our, this is our one norm here. So this indicator function of a n star composed of Tn. Okay, this is our, uh, our discrete problem raised to the continuum level. And then this a star here is the indicator function of the continuum Giga cut. This is going to be bounded by some sort of error, okay, which is you know, essentially given in this kind of horrible form. It only can depend on your choice of length scales, you know, how much you sort of the approximation you had to make in your transport map, and you know, something essentially controls the probability. So that kind of brings us to the end of my talk. Just as kind of a final sort of uh, advertisement. So Philip mentioned this earlier this week. Um, I'm part of I'm one of the organizers for this um, one world seminar series on the mathematics of machine learning. So if after this workshop you're still kind of hungry for talks on uh, theoretical machine learning, I would encourage you to sort of check out this seminar. We have a web page and we have a mailing list which you can sign up to. Um, and this is every Wednesday it's at five o'clock. So with that, I will finish my talk and thank you very much.